Thanks so much, Marius. Uh, well, thanks a lot to the organizers um, for, for having me uh, speak at this nice conference. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasant time, actually. It's sort of a, like a nice after hours workshop. And you know, it's like good to, to zone out or you know, to relax in the evening with some nice talks. So I hope you'll, you'll also enjoy this one. Um, yeah, so it's great to talk about this topic. So, so I want to speak about uh, our work on quantum breast complete inequalities and, and dualities that, that we wrote with Mario, um, who's in the audience, and, and David Sutta, who I think will also speak this week. Um, I didn't see him among the Davids who are currently locked in. Um, yeah, it's, it's also a bit daunting because I, I guess uh, there's many experts in the audience in breast complete inequalities. Some of them even have invented them. So uh, that's, of course, uh, very exciting. Um, but nevertheless, I hope... Uh, you'll learn something new and have a good time. So, so basically here's the high level overview of the talk. So I, um, classically, um, breast bleeding inequalities um, are these beautiful, uh, very general class of inequalities with lots of interesting applications and some aspect uh, that, that is uh, maybe more recent than, than you know, well, that was discovered uh, quite a bit after, I think uh, they, the inequalities themselves were discovered was an alternative reformulation. So a dual, a dual formulation in terms of entropy inequalities that are a bit like generalized subadditivity inequalities. And so that's, that's very interesting and, and very exciting. And what we are doing uh, in this work is we are studying a certain quantum form formulation of proximity inequalities where, well, I wrote that they're geometric inequalities that originally integral inequalities. Uh, now this would, would, uh, would be replaced by trace inequalities, but we'll still have entropy on the other side. Okay? And in fact, this has already been um, you know, addressed by previous work. So what we're really doing is we're also generalizing to relative entropies uh, general quantum channels and so on. So that's that's one part. Um, and if you want the motivation, maybe one very general motivation is, if, well, I guess comes from Andreas's talk um, uh, as well as many others, which is that you know we really like entropy inequalities. They're extremely useful. They're also hard to prove. So any new tool uh, is in principle exciting. I'll give you some more concrete motivations as we move along uh, the talk. So the first thing I want to do is basically give an introduction. I'll want to recall this uh, class of inequalities uh, in their classical form. Um, then I want to present our uh, duality result, uh, sketch uh, very uh, roughly some applications and connections. There will be uh, maybe more questions than answers. Um, and then I want to present uh, another result that's in some sense a quantum version of, of the very original uh, uh, bleep inequalities uh, as they were discussed uh, early on. Okay, and we call them geometric uh, quantum bleep inequalities. And I'll discuss what this means uh, in a bit. Great, so that's the plan. Um, so here's um, what a breast complete inequality uh, might look like in and, and one uh, formulation. So it's a bit uh, maybe of a daunting expression if you haven't uh, seen it before, so maybe let, you, let me walk through it. So the idea is you have uh, you st start with a bunch of linear maps, just check the linear maps from so the same original space, the R to the M to R to the M sub K, and some weights Q and uh, a, say a constant C. And then we would say that a breast complete inequality holds if and only such an integral inequality is true for any uh, collection of functions fk. So these functions fk, they're defined on the on the range of these maps L. Um, so we compose them with L to get a function on all of Rm. And so then we are just multiplying them, take, computing the integral. Okay. So that's a bit like, yeah, that's kind of an integral of product of functions. On the right-hand side, we just have norms. We have various LP norms um, of these functions fk. Okay. And we, want, we would like such inequality. So this is a very general family, and it includes as special cases many classical integral inequalities. For example, the Holder inequality, right, is something that you would obtain when these LKs are just identity maps, and then you would be bounding the integral of a product of functions in terms of LP norms. So, and then we know this holds if the sum of the Qs, these are inverses here, right? So if the sum of the Qs are, are, are wrong, for example. Okay, uh, Young's inequality for convolutions can be put into this framework uh, in a more slightly more interesting way. Um, maybe I don't want to explain the reduction right now. Um, Lumis Whitney inequalities fall into this framework uh, where the LKs are projections onto uh, quarter dimension one subspaces um, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so this is a very rich class uh, of inequalities. Um, I think there's several proofs from the original one, um, I, you know, focusing maybe on the rank one case to the general case. Um, and we'll meet one of the proof methods uh, in a bit, okay, and discuss how, how in which way this can be quantized. Uh, here are some facts. Um, uh, one celebrated result uh, is that the optimal constant C can be computed by restricted to Gaussian functions, to centered Gaussians. Okay, and so that's a, a, a beautiful way of computing it. Uh, why are this connection? One can also try to understand uh, when this when this constant is finite. That is basically if if for given uh, linear maps L, L sub k and weights Q k. Uh, they exist a finite constant C such that the inequality holds, okay? And this has been fully classified, not just the rank one case, but also the general case um, uh, by, by a nice structure result, okay? 
Uh, and this structured result in turn uh, allows one also to ask computation questions. So you might ask, you know, given this uh, data here, can I optimal, can I so say this data, can I compute the optimal constant efficiently? And this is so by an algorithm that runs in polynomial time in the input, okay? And that, that's possible in the rank one case, but in general, it's an interesting open problem. It connects all kinds of things to what people call operator scaling and um, um, uh, geodesic convex optimization theory, which is also things that, are, that I'm working on and interested in. So that's, I guess, it's my pet, uh, uh, pet interest that I also put in the slide here, okay? There's one uh, particularly well-behaved case, uh, which is called the geometric case. Okay, I guess uh, I'll, I'm going to use geometric in a double sense. So these are sort of, for me, geometric inequalities, but there's also the geometric case, which is the one when these LKs are projections onto subspaces um, or you know, subjective partial isometries, such that the corresponding weighted sum of the projections add up to the identity. So this looks a bit like a condition for POVM with the weights, um, but here it's all classical, right? Okay, um, very good. So that's the integral, the geometric side. Um, now, it turns out, um, and this has been discovered by Eric and Carl and then collaborator, um, that uh, any risk complete inequality, so the validity of the function of the inequalities had on the previous slide for all functions f sub k, is completely equivalent uh, to a kind of subadditivity inequality for the differential entropy in this case, but there's a, there's a very general duality in general. Okay. And if in, in this particular case I'm stating here, it, it looks as follows. Um, namely that if you take a random variable on R to the M, say it has a density, then you can define the differential entropy. What we're saying is that the differential entropy uh, minus a certain constant, that's the same constant as in the previous inequality or the logarithm of the same constant as in the previous inequality, uh, is less equal to a sum, uh, a weighted sum of entropies of these projections, right? So you project, uh, sorry, uh, of the images of this random variable when you apply the same linear maps as before, right? So the data from before were these linear maps, these weights and the constant, they're the same ones that appear here in this entropic formulation, okay? And that's very cool because we like entropies, but it's also cool because it enables new proof techniques. Um, so there's a, a, in the same paper, the authors also sketch a, a very nice proof using heat flow ideas uh, to actually establish present dependent qualities uh, in this geometric case, and then one can transform to get the general, to, to also understand the general case, okay? So that's very cool. Now, this duality holds much more generally. I, I mentioned this already. Um, so in, in sort of information static language, one can replace, uh, so what's going on here, right, is we have, a, we look at the push forward of a probability density on R to the, on RM to some subspace of say R to, uh, 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 to a density on R to, to a measure on R to the M sub K. Uh, one can replace this by an arbitrary channel, and one can also replace entropies by relative entropies, okay, and again, one, uh, one, one obtains a, a duality between an entropy, a relative entropy inequality, uh, which I'll state precisely on the next slide or so, and an integral inequality. In this case, that would be weighted LP norms and whatnot. Okay, and that's a very general framework that uh, sort of captures, you know, interesting things like hyperconductivity, constant, strong data processing inequalities. And when I say capture, I mean that one can express these problems in this framework and then, you know, apply the duality to obtain equivalent formulations that may or may not be easier to attack. Okay. So um, it's sort of th this class of work that uh, I guess inspired uh, 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 Mario, David, and I to sort of revisit this question uh, and to think about uh, these kind of problems. Uh, and so basically here, I can be now a bit more, more precise about the results and, and sort of basically, I want to discuss two in this talks. One is a quantum version of this general equivalence, okay? And I want to sketch down some applications. And the other is a quantum version actually of these original uh, first of inequalities on R to the M except that we're going to replace densities in R to the M by quantum states on the square integral function of, of, uh, of, R, of R to the M, okay? So then we sort of retain some geometric flavor and we can really ask, you know, what if you have a bunch of uh, linear maps, we can try to formulate and prove inequalities. So that's the sec second thing I wanna discuss. All right, so here that's, okay, that's a bit of a daunting uh, uh, expression perhaps, um, but so this is our duality result. Okay, um, so maybe let me run you through it. So the data that underlies it is a bunch of uh, channels or let's say even just positive and trace preserving maps uh, from operators in some Hilbert space to some, you know, which is always the same for all K as before, right? We had densities in R to the M to some other hill operators in some other Hilbert spaces. Um, then we have again weight Q and a constant C, uh, but now we have also some additional data because we are going to compute relative entropies. And uh, these state sigma, we are going to call uh, the reference state, if you wish, okay. And then we have again, two inequalities that are equivalent. 
or whose validity is equivalent. So here's the first one. And so this it looks a bit like a generalized data processing inequality of some sorts, right? So we are, we are looking at an, at an arbitrary state and we are comparing the relative entropy between rho and this reference state sigma uh, with uh, some weight, uh, weighted uh, sum um, of relative entries between the channel output um, for channel K applied to, the, applied to the same state, to this input state rho, as compared or relative to uh, these other reference states, sigma sub k, okay? And the idea is that this uh, inequality, uh, its validity for all rho is equivalent to the validity of such a, a you know, non-commutative integral or trace inequality. Um, and maybe we'll start with the right-hand side, right? So if you sort of uh, pretended that everything here commuted and you wouldn't have to worry um, about non-commutativity, right? You can see that this is a bit like a sigma k weighted um, LP norm or L1 over Q norm of this operator omega, okay? But of course, there's, you know, it's like an exponential of a sum of the logarithm, so it's not exactly right. Nevertheless, for some range of Q, one can interpret this object as an anti-norm. Uh, if the Qs are larger than zero, so one where Q is less than zero. In other cases, it's, it's not as nice of a well-behaved object, but I think the intuition is the same. It's, it's some kind of a not quite norm uh, weighted by sigma, okay? And then the left-hand side, we have basically the non-commutative version of integral weighted by sigma, well, P is sigma K, and on the left-hand side, we have something like a, a sigma-weighted uh, integral, non-commutative integral or trace uh, of this, uh, this, uh, this well, what would be classically a product of the e stars or omegas, okay? So that's the duality, okay? Um, one can prove this, and, and it's not so hard, right? Using a variational characterization of the Legendre, uh, of the relative entropy, somewhat similarly, uh, you know, to the classical situation. Uh, and it's actually not, I mean, in some sense, not clear which side of, uh, looks more intimidating, right? I mean, I guess the bottom one, um, uh, on the other, yeah. Um, so, so historically, I guess, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll say more about this in a moment. Um, we, I guess we kind of like to prove these things, they seem hard, but the alternative maybe doesn't seem so much easier. So that's something we'll discuss about in a moment. Um, maybe to get some more intuition though, let's focus on uh, two special cases, right? One special case to sort of illuminate why one might care about this is sort of obvious. Uh, if you if you if you pick these reference states sigma k to be the channel outputs uh, of, of sigma right of the other reference state sigma, then this really looks like a kind of a generalized kind of data processing uh, style inequality, right? That's one special case which we might come back to. The other one is um, if we pick these sigmas uh, and and sigma sub k is and sigma to be all equal to an identity operator, we do it to identity operators. In this case, these relative entropies they become negative entropies. Right, and this becomes again a you know a subadditivity style uh, entropy inequality. Okay, and that's what I list on the next slide, and that's essentially a, a result due to to a, a, a recurrent LED leap uh, from I think uh, two thousand eight or nine, um, where they proved exactly this equivalence in the in this case with outside information without reference state sigma. Okay, um, and and so here we 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 see that this is you know a generalized kind of subadditivity inequality. It looks, you know, very much like a generalization. Well, look uh, of the classical one for the differential entropy that we saw earlier on. Okay, and indeed, also on the dual side, things become more pleasant. Right here, it's just a product of these LP or L1 over Q norms, and on the left hand side, there's a non-commutative version of this uh, this integral, right, of, uh, that that we discussed earlier. Okay. Um, so now, is this good for anything? So, so here it is. It is sort of you know more more pleasant for the purpose of this talk to give some example. So one thing that we can do is right. We can imagine. So what you know. Uh, so this left hand side thing, right? If this constant c is less than one, then this uh, term is a positive correction. Then this is an uncertainty relation, right? It says that the uh, say even if you start with a pure state, the channel outputs, you know, one of them will be mixed at least, right? And it, it gives it says on the quantitative sense. So it's natural to try to prove uncertainty relations in this way by instead proving a corresponding trace inequality. And this has been is an approach that has been pioneered, uh, I think, by by Burke by by Frank and Lieb. Uh, for example, they, they they demonstrated how to prove this uh, mass and Ufeng uncertainty relation, which is uh, well, Jeff, uh, which I write down here for. A conjugate measurements, but it works for any pair of measurements, for any pair for projective measurements. Uh, why are the Golden Thompson inequality? Okay. Um, and so that's for two measurements. You can also do it, for example, for three measurements. You can look at, say, the, all the Pauli observables on a qubit. That's uh, called the six state uncertainty relation sometimes. One can prove it with LED uh, triple matrix inequality. Okay. So, so that's maybe a, an example, okay, of this, of this framework, why it might be useful. All right. Now, um, here are some connections and, and maybe interesting questions that would have been really nice to discuss in person. Um, and well, maybe you can still do this in the breakout room. Um, so, so one natural question, right, given the previous slide is, can we prove new uncertainty relations, especially ones involving multiple measurements, right? And for, for example, man, why do you use these, these N matrix generalization of Golden Thompson that you know, some of my co-authors uh, uh, 
worked and discovered. Um, and uh, you know, maybe one can also say something for general quantum channels. So there's this nice paper by Mario's where they discuss in such a relation for general pairs of channels. Can one say something more general here? So that's maybe one interesting direction. Uh, then another observation is that uh, you know, a strong data processing inequality, that's an inequality, data processing inequality, say for a specific channel sigma, maybe even a, a, a sorry, a E, and a, a, maybe even a specific reference state uh, sigma. Uh, it's a data processing inequality where, that holds with this uh, with a constant eta here that, that may be less than one. Okay, that's a strong data processing inequality. That's eminently captured by the framework. And so one could address this via trace inequalities. Okay, and we give a little proof of concept in the paper to recover some, some known result there. And here's another interesting connection. So classically, uh, there's a property called tensorization that's known to hold. So if you have a possible even inequalities for a set of channels E and with holding with constant C and similarly E prime and C prime, Time, then uh, there is a then the corresponding possible even inequality holds a product of constants and the tense product of the channels and, and, and one formulates this appropriately. Quantumly, this fails, but for an interesting reason, it's related to non-additivity phenomena. So the converse question now is, you know, can we somehow learn something new from this? Uh, from this, uh, you know, basically putting the well, uh, connecting these two topics. Okay. Um, then, uh, you know, firstly, I'm also interested uh, quite a bit in the, these last uh, points, so the computation complexity aspects I mentioned, and then there's there's, there's other very exciting works of that, you know, roughly falls to this ballpark uh, by people in the audience, and I would be very excited to understand this better and learn more about the connections. All right, so that's the first part, duality. Um, I think I have uh, four minutes left, so we can... Uh, talk about the second part as well. And so for this, um, so we discussed the duality so far. Um, Mario smiles, I take this as an agreement that I, I do have four minutes left. Um, uh, so, so now, so this was the duality result. Okay, so now I wanna give you an actually a new, uh, new entropy inequality, okay? And um, so, you, well, as, as uh, Andreas mentioned, it's really hard to prove new entropy inequalities that are not just strong subjectivity. Um, Matthias confirmed this, and I will also confirm it, but change the question. So I want to look at a larger class of entropy inequalities, and maybe those are easier to prove. Okay. And the inspiration will come uh, from these classical cross-complete inequalities in the entropic formulation that I discussed before. And I want to focus on what I call the geometric case. And the geometric case was the one where these linear maps have, these linear maps have projections. Okay. And in this case, so, so what, do we, what do we have? So again, we have a, a, a continuous random variable on R to the M with the density. And we uh, can relate the, we can, uh, in this case, we can upper bound the differential entropy of the overall distribution uh, by this weighted sum uh, of differential piece of the projected random variables. Um, and these PJ, PKs here, they should be projections onto subspaces that satisfy this P of M like condition. So the weighted sum should be the identity. So this is what I called the geometric case before. And in this case, such an inequality holds with constant zero, with additive constant zero. So there's no plus log C floating around, okay. And as I mentioned before, classically one can reduce the general case to this one by kind of applying general linear transformations and doing some smart rescaling. So in some sense, this is a very interesting case. And the question is, can we formulate a quantum version of this inequality? And I guess I spoiled the answer before, right? So the question is, how can we imitate something like projecting, you know, basically marginalizing, well, projecting on a subspace or marginalizing over the orthogonal complement. Okay, and here's one way by which you could do it. You could take your subspace. Uh, you could uh, uh, think of your square integral functions uh, on R to the M as the Hilbert space. You could think of this one. Well, the the R to the M, right? It's a, it's a direct sum of, of V and its orthogonal complement. Um, in other words, the, the square root of functions they factorize into the square root of functions on V tensor the ones on the orthogonal complement. Okay, and, and so we can, by a partial trace of this tensor factor, we can define a reduced state on any vector subspace of R to the M, okay? For quantum states on square integral function on, on R to the M, okay? So in this sense, we can have both the geometry of R to the M as well as the quantum nature, as well as quantum states. And you might ask, does such an entropy inequality also hold in that case, okay? And so this is clearly a notion that generalizes the partial trace because if I take as my subspace V, a coordinate subspace, so spent by you know standard basis vectors, then I just get the ordinary partial trace with respect to thinking of this space you know as L two of R times L two of R and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and there's a nice interpretation in terms of networks of beam splitter. So this is some so you can um, uh, write one way of thinking with uh, an alternative way of thinking about what I discussed here is that you can first apply a rotation of your coordinates and then an ordinary partial trace and rotations on R to the end. There are special Gaussian unitaries that that. That, it, that one can understand, um, and, and they, roughly speaking, correspond to networks of beam spiders. Okay, cool. So, and now this is the, the second, second result I wanted to mention. So we can show that under this geometric condition, 
Uh, in fact, we have such an uh, so such a Bruskov deep inequality, which we call a geometric quantum Bruskov deep inequality. Um, so that's exactly the condition on the subspace I mentioned before. And the, this is the assertion uh, for all states, and let's say they are finite first and second moment. Okay. Now, for coordinate subspaces, it's important to say that these are really just ordinary, you know, partial uh, reduced density matrices, uh, as I mentioned before. In this case, you can think of this as a quantum version of the Shearer's inequalities, uh, of a Shearer's inequality. And that's actually contained in the paper by, by Eric and Elliot um, that I mentioned before. So, but what's, but already, you know, in such a configuration, let's say you look at R2 and you look at a, like sort of a, a German car maker uh, style configuration, then um, uh, this is, does not fall into the framework, right? If these like rotations by 120 degrees. And so that's, that's, these are not like, you know, all like ordinary partial traces. Uh, so that's one comment. Maybe um, I, uh, I guess I'll just make two more comments, uh, flash my proof slide, and then wrap up. Uh, the other comment is that, you know, just like in the classical case, one can in principle generate new inequalities from old ones uh, by applying linear transformations. Uh, so one thing you could do is you could apply a general linear transformation RM with some suitable determinants in front so that things stay normalized quantum states. But actually, there's even a larger group acting, namely a symplectic group, SP2N, is acting here by what, what is often called Gaussian unitaries. Um, and so in this way, one can, you know, even like, uh, you know, replace a uh, subspace of R to the M by say isotropic subspaces of the underlying phase space, these kind of things. Um, we can also prove a version condition on side information. This is not, not written up in the paper though. So you should not believe me at this point, um, but, but that's going to work as well. Okay. Um, we had a master student export us um, in, in, in their thesis. Um, if Marius allows me, I will maybe briefly say uh, something here. So Marius, when should I stop? Should I skip the proofs? Um, so I know you, you're at plus one, minute? one. So 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 one or two minutes is fine, but everything. Go. Fantastic. I think that, that's super. OK, so this is the inequality. And I just want to basically tell you, uh, uh, because I, I, OK, I really like the proof strategy because it's not ours. OK. So it's a proof strategy by, 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 by Eric and collaborator that I mentioned before, right? So when they, they reformulated the uh, Russell Lieben course in terms of entropy, uh, generalized subadditivity inequality, and then they could attack those using heat flow techniques based on, uh, I think, previous work that that, that does in a more special case, okay? And so we wanted to imitate their, their, their proof strategy. Uh, and the idea was that one can use a, a quantum version of the heat flow, okay? And so that's, uh, you know, a, a Lindblad equation and the right-hand side generator is generated by these quadrature operators, the Qs and the Ps on your, on, on your conjugation space. And uh, then the idea is extremely beautiful. And so I can say this in, in one minute. So the idea is that for large times, right, what happens, just like in the classical cases, you get a Gaussian that's basically uniform and has a large variance. Uh, in particular, the entropy will basically becomes independent of the initial state. And I think it just basically scales like log of the time uh, times the num the dimension of the subspace you're looking at. Okay, if I look at the marginal uh, of rho v. Okay, in particular, uh, the inequality that we want to prove here uh, holds for the at time infinity. It holds exactly when you know that weighted sum of the dimensions where we project on is you know larger or equals to m because then you know that, that's exactly going to be true. Okay. Um, now we need a second input, right? So what we're going to show is that as we approach infinity, the inequality only gets tighter. So what we want to show is a reverse inequality for the derivative of entropy, and that's given by the Fisher information. Okay, and uh, for this, basically, to, um, this has been you know uh, studied by, by by Robert, I think, who's also in the audience, and Graham Smith, and I think uh, Giacomo has sort of you know put more analytical rigor on this. Um, so, so that now we can, uh, uh, you know, be very con confident about the absence and deltas, which is which is super. And uh, so the idea is that we can basically use this um, to prove a reverse inequality for the Fisher information, so for the entropy production along the heat flow, if this uh, operator inequality is true. Okay, and that's not so hard then in the end to see. So, so kind of in some sense, using you know the, the challenge was finding the right formulation and then you know picking the right tools, but now everything falls really nicely into place, and in this way we can prove this this class of inequalities. All right, so that's that's it. Okay, so here is just a quick summary. Uh, we study this con relative entropy formulation of a uh, you know, deep inequalities and, and dual trace inequalities, which we hope uh, is a unifying framework that might be useful to, to tackle more information data questions. And you know, as a sort of a, a nice little appetizer, there was also these new class of geometric uh, quantum versions of the well, the quantum versions of geometric Bruskin deep inequalities. And I, I think there's lots of inter interesting, exciting direction, open question to pursue. So thanks very much um, for your attention.